William Lloyd Garrison had called slavery evil, and his opprobrium implied that slave owners and those that supported the peculiar institution were also evil. For the honorable and God-fearing people of the South, this sounded like blasphemy. It demanded a response. One came in the September 1832 issue of the American Quarterly Review, then expanded in pamphlet form entitled Review of the Debate in the Virginia Legislature, 1831-1832. Thomas Roderick Dew, professor of history, metaphysics, and political economy at William & Mary, argued that slavery was not a sin, nor was it immoral. He wrote that masters treated their slaves with benevolence and fairness, and slaves responded with joyful obedience. Dew continued that it was through the enslavement of Africans that all whites ascended to the same level of social attainment. Color alone here is the badge of distinction. Threats to the security of the South came from non-Southerners. Dew continued, nothing then but the most subtle and poisonous principles sedulously infused into the slave's mind can break his allegiance and transform him into the midnight murderer. Other ardent defenders of slavery followed Professor Dew, writing their own pamphlets justifying the Southern institution. In 1833, Zephaniah Kingsley authored a treatise on the patriarchal slave system. In the same year, Richard H. Colfax wrote, evidence against the views of the abolitionists consisting of physical and moral proofs of the natural inferiority of the Negroes. One year later, White Marsh Seabrook authored an appeal to the people of the northern and eastern states on the subject of Negro slavery. Other pro-slavery supporters took a different more violent approach to abolitionists. This violence only increased the determination of the abolitionists. I'm Tom Army, and this is U.S. History Online. In this episode, Causes of the American Civil War, Abolition, Liberty, and Free Speech, we continue to explore the rising tensions surrounding the issue of slavery in the decades before the Civil War. The troublesome predicament that no one in Congress discussed in the 1820s and early 1830s would soon become the only issue everyone in Congress pondered. What broke the vow of silence? How did most Northerners and Westerners come to see support of slavery as a conspiracy that had to end. A series of events between 1834 and 1837 demonstrated the animosity and anger many people felt about the abolitionist movement. White mobs in northern towns burned black neighborhoods to the ground and threatened abolitionists with bodily harm. Prudence Crandall, had opened a school in Canterbury, Connecticut to educate African-American girls. In 1834, mob violence forced her to close the school. In New York City and Philadelphia, throngs vandalized African-American churches, homes, and orphanages. They threw rocks at residents. In 1835, the poet John Greenleaf Whittier and British abolitionist George Thompson were stoned in Concord, New Hampshire. Later, a mob looking for Thompson broke up a meeting of the female anti-slavery society in Boston. They caught Garrison instead and dragged him through the streets at the end of a rope. 
Fortunately, the mayor finally rescued Garrison. At the annual meeting of the American Anti-Slavery Society in May 1835, a partner from a prominent mercantile house in New York City approached the Unitarian minister, the Reverend Samuel Joseph May, insisting that the Constitution protected slavery. The merchant argued that Southerners owed millions of dollars to the merchants and mechanics of New York City alone. Accordingly, the merchant continued, we cannot afford, sir, to let you and your associates succeed in your endeavor to overthrow slavery. It is not a matter of principle with us. It is a matter of business. On another occasion, a group of merchants, lawyers, and bankers broke up an abolitionist convention in Utica, New York, with similar threats. In the meantime, Postmaster General Amos Kendall advised President Andrew Jackson, a slaveholder, that the President's constitutional duty required him to stop abolitionists from inciting servile insurrection through newspapers, pamphlets, and tracts. Southern postmasters already restricted the delivery of abolitionist mail. Jackson did believe incendiary mail represented a threat to the Union. And so Jackson asked Congress to pass a law making it illegal to distribute abolitionist material via the post office. This time Congress refused. They cited in part the stifling of free speech and the expansion of executive authority. Jackson's political enemies, and the list was long, referred to the president as King Andrew, and Congress decided the president had already arbitrarily exceeded his presidential power. Yet, the concept of silencing abolitionists was intriguing. But trying to silence abolitionists through violence continued in 1836. In Cincinnati, Ohio, James Birney, a former Alabama slave owner, had established a newspaper sponsored by the Ohio Anti-Slavery Society. Anti-slavery propaganda angered local businessmen keen to do business with southern states. Similarly, white workers disliked anti-slavery propaganda because they were worried about their jobs if they had to compete with free blacks. Riots broke out in April and in July. Rioters killed an unknown number of blacks. One year later, after Elijah Lovejoy set up yet another abolitionist newspaper supporting the Illinois branch of the American Anti-Slavery Society, mobs destroyed his printing press three times. When the violent horde attacked for the fourth time, Lovejoy had prepared to defend himself. Instead, the attackers shot him to death. Still, anti-abolitionist violence and threats failed to silence abolitionist voices. The American Anti-Slavery Society launched a political campaign and flooded Congress with petitions containing close to a half a million signatures. These petitions demanded the immediate abolition of slavery in the nation's capital and stopping any new slave states from being cut from the U.S. territory. Political moderates in the North started to question whether slavery and their supporters violated the abolitionists' First Amendment rights to free speech. Furthermore, they began to see the fugitive slave laws of 1793 as unfair because they trampled a person's liberty, the right of an individual to reject slavery. 
The intended purpose of the laws was to protect the constitutional rights of slave owners when dealing with escaped slaves. Under the law, a slave owner could go into a northern state looking for their escapee and instead capture a free black. They could drag them before a federal or local judge and upon proof, take them back to the South. The testimony of one witness counted as sufficient proof. The bias system favored the slave owner. The fugitive slave laws also fined anyone $500 who helped an escaped slave or obstructed a slave owner's attempt to retake a slave or a free black. In rebuttal, northern states gradually adopted personal liberty laws to protect the rights of those who refused to turn in or who obstructed the capture of fugitive slaves or free blacks. These laws endeavored to protect the personal liberty of everyone. In 1836, the Massachusetts Supreme Court ruled in Commonwealth v. Aves that Thomas Aves's daughter, Mary Slater, could not exercise her property rights upon a slave there since Massachusetts was a free state. The court's famous Chief Justice, Lemuel Shaw, wrote, all persons coming within the limits of a state become subject to all its municipal laws, civil and criminal, and entitled to the privileges which those laws confer. This rule applies as well to blacks as whites. The court thus barred Slater from taking the six-year-old slave girl Med back to Louisiana, and the court ordered that Med be put into a guardian's custody instead. The abolitionist movement was growing, and citizens bombarded Congress with petitions. By 1840, there were 2,000 local abolitionist societies across the North and West. While most Americans remained anti-abolitionists, violence and threats against abolitionists started to make citizens wonder whether their free speech protection was now under attack.